How do we know what's happening here? This is the central question of theorist Irving Goffman's canonical book, Frame Analysis. In Frame Analysis, Goffman systematically explores the social frameworks that help us understand the world around us. How do we know when someone is joking? How are we able to tell the difference between an argument in a play and an argument in everyday life? It may seem obvious and intuitive, but there are a whole range of cues, Goffman calls these keys, that signal just what sort of reality we're observing. Applying Goffman's notion of frames and keys to cinema, how do we know how to interpret the images before us? What keys indicate whether we're watching nonfiction, fiction, or something in between? In most films, this is fairly straightforward. Usually we know before we even sit down to a film if it's fiction or documentary. But in the genre of the hybrid film, or the pseudo-documentary, the cues may lead us astray. Films like F for Fake and Symbio-Psychotaxiplasm utilize the documentary form to undermine cinematic representations of truth. The documentary frame authenticates the images, implying that they represent reality. However, the filmmakers reveal these frames to be false cues. More was constructed than we initially thought. After your old tricks, I see. Why not? I'm a charlatan. Cheryl Dunya's 1996 film, The Watermelon Woman, appropriates the documentary form for quite a different reason. Instead of undermining reality, Dunya constructs one. In Watermelon Woman, the documentary frame does still authenticate the images, similar to other hybrid films, but with the purpose of reconstructing a history of black women and black lesbians. I know it has to be about black women because our stories have never been told. Through a mixture of nonfiction and fiction frames, Dunya explores the complex relationships between race, sexuality, and class. And instead of exposing the falsity of cinematic representation, she exposes the falsity of historical representation, which has repeatedly omitted African Americans, women, and LGBTQ people from its narratives. The first frame in The Watermelon Woman is nonfiction, but not solely documentary. The film opens on Cheryl and Tamara doing videography at a wedding, from the perspective of the video that they're shooting. Certain formal cues let us know that we're watching videography. Don't you even see the video equipment? We see the mechanisms of filmmaking as Tamara carries around the reflector board. Everything comes from one camera setup. The image is lower resolution and the highlights are blown out in places. The audio has a slight hiss and the wedding guests keep looking at the camera. This first frame is thematically one of the most important as the video camera is associated with self-documentation. Video cameras shoot weddings, bar mitzvahs, family vacations, and holidays. Later, Cheryl will use this same video camera to record interviews and to record herself directly addressing the camera, explaining the genesis and continued process behind her documentary on Faye Richards, The Watermelon Woman. History has often neglected everyday experience, particularly the experiences of marginalized people. The ability to self-document enables people to write their own personal histories preserve their voices, and define their own experiences. The next frame is the fiction frame that we're accustomed to, and the bulk of The Watermelon Woman is filmed this way. Shot on 16mm rather than video, these sections have a third-person perspective. Multiple camera setups, three-point lighting, continuity editing, clear audio, and a higher image quality. In the fiction frame, we watch Cheryl navigate the cues within her own reality. Keys can indicate sexual orientation, helping Cheryl recognize the watermelon woman, Faye Richards, as a fellow lesbian. Can you believe it? Faye's a sapphic sister, a bull dagger, a lesbian. Oh my gosh, I knew something was up when I saw Plantation Memories. They also reveal Diana's racial and class privilege. We traveled everywhere. I was born when we were stationed in Jamaica. You were born in Jamaica? Yeah, I love telling people where I was born. Though Cheryl, her friends, and the audience may pick up on these keys at different moments in the film, and Diana may not pick up on them at all. Well, first tell me what you meant by that. The last frame is the found footage frame. It consists of classical Hollywood films and race films from the 1930s and 40s, newsreels, and photographs. Their historical status is keyed by black and white images, vertical lines or dust specks that signify old film stock, period costumes and hair, dramatic performance styles, oh, don't cry, Missy. Master Charles is coming back for sure. 
and typography associated with the 30s and 40s. The Watermelon Woman also includes some color home movie footage of Faye Richards and her partner June. The film grain and the dust specks on the image make it look like Super 8 millimeter. This is a documentary frame that we associate with historical truth because we are used to seeing found footage used as historical evidence within documentaries. Several times in The Watermelon Woman, the found footage is accompanied by interviews on the soundtrack, a technique commonly used in documentary. The interviews supply first-person testimony of the documentary's subject, and the footage provides additional authentication of that testimony by serving as a visual record of an historical moment. Of course, we find out in the closing credits of The Watermelon Woman that all of the found footage and all the interviews were a construction. Faye Richards did not exist. There was no Watermelon Woman. And yet, unlike other hybrid films, this reveal doesn't feel like an exposure of the limits of cinematic representation. Instead, it feels like a realization of the potential for cinema to construct realities. By appropriating the frames of nonfiction cinema, Dunya was able to uncover and fill an historical absence. Hi. As she says in her closing title card, sometimes you have to create your own history. I'm Laura Ivins. Thank you for watching.